Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, uh, welcome back again to our course film appreciation. Now, um, here is a link to a wonderful movie, a short film that I would like you to watch. Please watch the film and then we will continue the lecture. So, um, here is the link, the uh, film is Two Men and a Cupboard, a short film by Roman Polanski. Please, wa please watch the film and then uh, we will continue with our talk. Welcome back. So, I am sure that you have watched the film and uh, uh, let me just give you a brief or quick dis um, overview or the description of the film what is uh, the film about what the film is all about now roman polanski's two men and a uh, two men and a wardrobe is a short film about two men who emerge from the sea carrying an uh, enormous wardrobe now this is very surreal you remember we have been talking about surrealism uh, existing in a dream like state uh, the blurring of boundaries between the real uh, and the dream like state the fictitious. Now, this is extremely surreal in the sense that uh, logically, practically it is not possible for men to emerge from uh, a sea and then return to the sea as they do in, uh, at the end of the movie. So, this is not logically, rationally possible, but we believe it because the film exists in, as a sort of a metaphor. All right, so this is a surreal activity, and we know, and you have already, uh, by now I am all, uh, I am sure that you have already observed that wherever these two men go, they are treated as unwelcome guests. So they are chased away uh, from a tram, a restaurant, and a hotel. Uh, you know that uh, wherever they enter, they see. Uh, people who are uh, quite alike, you know the hotel, people who are in the hotel or in a restaurant, they, they are quite similar uh, as far as class is concerned, as far as races are concerned and also they are alike. Um, these men are, uh, they also get in a fight with some local, local hooligans, uh, they are beaten up very badly. By the end, the men return to the sea with their wardrobe. Now, this is a uh, almost 18 or 19 minutes long movie and it is what is it about? What do you think it is about? The film is about um, one uh, interpretation could be about the otherness, you know there are people like us and then there are people out there who are not like us. Okay, so, that otherness could be anything, it could be by way of your race, your language, the color of your skin, um, your religion, your nationality. So, all these things make you the other. So, whenever you are among um, a very homogeneous group and if you are not like them, then you are treated as the other. So, here Roman Polanski, who himself was a Polish Jew, okay, he was also a victim of the Holocaust during the Nazi regime. So, this part of you know this, this angle of being the other must have been ingrained in his psyche from the beginning. Now, uh, the entire array of responses that arise from otherness, you know, curiosity, antipathy, aggression about these people, it comes from there that uh, these people are just not accepted wherever they go. Polanski himself lived in a 
uh, lived a life uh, in exile and uh, this fact is also foregrounded in the film. Of course, lot of other things also happened to Roman Polanski later on in his life and he is still a sort of an exile person, but um, at the time of this movie uh, too, he was someone's other. So, the otherness in Roman Polanski uh, you know persists. So, this is a movie I showed you, um, one is to understand uh, the concept of otherness, also the fact uh, that uh, it emerges from the tradition of the theatre of the absurd. You know theatre of the absurd, uh, people like uh, Samuel Beckett who wrote the play Waiting for Godot, then we also had um, Eugene Ionesco who wrote his absurd display The Rhinoceros and also The Bald Soprano. Then Harold Pinter uh, who comes after these two great playwrights and he has written a string of plays which come under the which fall in the tradition of the absurdists, including a play called The Dumb Waiter. So, again we are talking about a pair of men, two men in caught in a situation and it is now there is no situation as such. We, the, the, the filmmaker or the playwright they, they, they do not tell us the, the situation, we have to understand. So, we have as uh, you know as a students of film appreciation, as cine enthusiasts, we have to develop that kind of sensitivity to understand that what the filmmaker is trying to show. So, the uh, two men and a wardrobe is not just a comedy, although it appears like a you know one of those Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton kind of you know, very physical comedy where things are happening here, yeah, but it is a very dark film. As the film progresses you must have noted it becomes darker and darker in its tone. Okay. And that is Polanski's worldview, that is the absurdist worldview, that violence, aggression, exclusion, they cannot be justified and uh, uh, they just, they are just there. So, you cannot escape them and whenever there is a clash between the majority and the minority, these things will happen and we live in an absurdist world, okay, which is quite meaningless. So, there is no sense in providing too much of an explanation for things for this kind of violence and aggression. So, this is what I wanted you to uh, be sensitive to. There is also an aspect called formalism and now I will talk about formalism and how cinema you know there is a form, there is a certain style of filmmaking. Formalism is a theory uh, that arose in the 1920s and 30s. So, I will be talking about how formalism and how the cinema, how cinema started uh, under the influence of formalism, the formalist theory that uh, how important the form of a film is rather than the content. Okay. So, uh, we are not looking at uh, the supremacy of style over content, but how a film is rather structured, we are looking at that. So, do not get confused between the two terms. So, for, uh, formalism which began as a literary theory in the 1920s and 30s, flourished during the 40s and the 50s and uh, um, is still in evidence today. It was initiated by a group of Russian critics. So, this is important, we have to remember that it is a Russian theory initiated by Russians and then uh, some of the earlier practitioners of formalism were uh, people uh, like uh, Einstein and uh, Budovkin, the Russian filmmakers. So, um, these critics wanted to develop a formal way to produce an objective method of analyzing literature. Formalists have generally suggested that everyday language which serves simply to communicate information is stale and unimaginative. As with many theories, formalism developed as a means of studying literary texts. It was an early attempt 
to uh, theorize and draw attention to the way narratives are constructed. Russian formalism refers primarily to the work of the Society for the Study of Poetic Language founded in 1916 in, in St. Petersburg. Key theorists are Vladimir Propp, Boris Eichenbaum, Viktor Shklovsky and Tynanov, Yuri Tynanov. And uh, secondary, uh, secondarily to the Moscow Linguistic Circle founded in 1914 by Roma Jakobson. Roma Jakobson described literature as organized violence committed on ordinary speech. Now, literature constitutes a deviation from average speech that intensifies, invigorates and estranges the mundane patterns, language patterns, uh, because uh, Roman, Roma Jakobson was basically a linguist. So, uh, by estrangement, what do we mean by it? So, it this device serves literature by forcing the reader to think about what might have been an ordinary piece of writing about a common life experience in a more thoughtful way. In the routines of everyday speech, our perceptions of and responses to reality become stale, blunted and as the formalist would say, automatized. Scientific approach focused on literariness which can be found on the level of form rather than content. So, it is that kind of theory. Formalism also understands art as a device of defamiliarization, where uh, the idea is that it, a text is the sum total of its devices form and content uh, that is fabula, that is a story and suze, which is the style, the content, the way a story is told. So, uh, while fabula is the raw material or the basic story, suze is the transformation of the fabula into a narrative discourse of aesthetic form. Suje is the information and organization of material presented on the screen. For example, you think of Usual Suspects by Brian Singer, it is a, mm, it is a mystery, it is a highest film, but it is the Suje, the way it is told, the, the, uh, the unpredictability of narrative which is important. So, formalism is concerned with the meaningfulness of the artistic devices. So, again let me draw your attention to the fact that we are not talking about supremacy of style over content. We are still talking about the way a narrative is told by employing certain artistic devices. The core of the text is not the th uh, theme, but its devices. So, believe the formalists. The emphasis on the actual processes of the presentation of a literary text is known as laying bare its own devices, something that is used by uh, filmmakers also. They lay bare the cinematic devices. In very experimental and avant-garde films, you must have watched that they start showing the uh, uh, um, uh, certain kinds of uh, uh, technical devices on screen. I can give you example, for example, um, Godas Breathless, a Buddha Sofla. So, there the two protagonists, the lead characters, they go around switching on lamps. Now, those lamps are not your ordinary lamps uh, that we employ in a room. These are like, those lamps are like, almost like studio lights and lamps. And they, by doing that, what is Godas trying to do? Laying bare the devices. He is showing you on a screen. See, uh, Abuddha Sofla was a very uh, brushed in kind of a film. The director tried to break certain uh, uh, traditions of the fourth wall. So, that is what is important. So, uh, laying bare the devices. According to Shklovsky, the most essential literary thing a novel can achieve is to draw attention to itself and the literary devices it employs. A concern with form and not the topic of the film, uh, such as editing or narrative, etcetera. And it is also used uh, in, in science to explain aesthetics, okay, where art is a system of science and conventions. Formalism is also uh, concerned with recognizing differences and similarities across texts in terms of aesthetics, narrative, cinematography, 
mise en scene, etc. Uh, some of the films that I would uh, uh, ask you to watch, uh, one is The Player, a 1992 film by Robert Altman and then also 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is a must watch for all cine enthusiasts, which is a 1968 film directed by Stanley Kubrick and you are aware of course of the famous jump cut, the uh, cut between you know the when um, uh, the man was uh, still a primate and then going on uh, in a spaceship. So, a jump of literally you know 2000 or perhaps even more years. So, that is what we mean by drawing attention to the stylistic devices, artistic devices. So, um, continuing with our formalism and its theories, one of the key theories of uh, this uh, uh, movement is uh, Vladimir Propp, who wrote Morphology of the Folk Tale in 1928. Propp categorizes characters, and the idea is that how these characters appear in folk tales and according the word that the expression that Propp gives us is the seven spheres of action. So, for, for Propp, you have uh, the characters can be categorized into um, or as villain, helper, donor the magician, female in distress, a dispatcher, uh, a hero and a false hero. Prop uh, is also so, uh, associated with something called functions, where each function represents a different stage in the protagonist's journey. Now, um, <coughs> you can apply this uh, feature uh, very well to Christopher Nolan's uh, The Dark Knight. You know, so you have the villain. Who is the villain? The Joker. You have the helper. You have the magician as played by uh, Mor the Morgan uh, Freeman character, you know, who creates uh, certain things, the kinds of things for uh, Batman, um, which are just not possible for any other man to create. You have a damsel in distress, okay, that is uh, uh, Batman's lady love. Then uh, you have the false hero, okay, as uh, played by the district attorney, who later on becomes uh, almost uh, uh, a villain. Okay, so, uh, the two face. You have the sheriff, who is the donor and then of course, you have Batman, who is your hero. So, you can, uh, uh, I am not, uh, this is a template that several films employ, even in a popular film like the Lord of the Rings. If you apply these ideas, I am very sure that uh, such kind of a template would emerge. Viktor uh, Shklovsky's uh, another great uh, uh, contribution is an essay called Art as Technique, which is, was published in 1970s, where 1917, where he argued that non-poetic forms cause our perceptions of familiar objects to become dulled out of habit. But poetic forms make us see ordinary things in a different way to make the familiar strange or ostrogyny, that is the word he uses. According to Shklovsky, literature has the ability to make you uh, make us see the world anew, to make that which has become familiar because we have been overexposed to it. So, a familiar world becoming strange. Now, um, we were talking about uh, some of the features so of uh, uh, of uh, um, formalism and editing is one key feature of formalism. In fact, it is very important. So, what does an editor do? Editor's work is to shape many hours of raw film into a few hours of finished film. It gives form to the movie and the final picture depends on how it is edited. Some of the famous collaborators, director, editor collaborations have been uh, between Francis Ford Coppola and Walter Murch, especially Apocalypse Now, and think Martin Scorsese and his frequent or constant collaborator Thelma Schoonmaker. Then you have Steven Spielberg and uh, his collaborator Michael Kahn, 
Woody Allen has often worked with uh, Susan E. Moss okay, and then you have Quint Quentin Tarantino and Sally Mank. So, these are the these uh, uh, director and editor combination often comes together and uh, they create magic. Now, what are the types of editing? So, some of the uh, you know very highly recognized kinds of editing techniques include film splicing, linear editing uh, which is uh, uh, an uh, original early method for uh, editing films. Then you have uh, digital and non uh, linear style of editing films. Here uh, editors often use software and then you have live editing as in live television coverage. Some of the features of continuity and discontinuity editing are like in continuity editing uh, which is more like old Hollywood classic, a classic Hollywood style of film or narrative style of filmmaking. So, um, it is very analytic, it is invisible, it does not call attention to itself and shots are subordinated to unity of the narrative. They imply a passive spectator, a spectator is expected to believe and absorb whatever he or she is shown. Now, discontinuity editing is a more modernist and avant-garde, experimental in nature. It foregrounds short transition and calls attention to itself. Okay. It implies that the spectator is active and actively participates on what is happening and can create his or her own meaning into that. Uh, editing also entails something called establishing shot, re-establishing shot, where the opening shot uh, is uh, created to establish the loca location and distance between characters. So, now uh, just to recap the uh, features of formalism as a theory. Now, the key ideas are a concern with form over content at the expense of subject. The topic of a film for the early formalists was unimportant, instead the focus was on how the film was physically put together. Again we are talking about editing and its narrative structure. They were also interested in finding a scientific way of understanding and writing about an artistic form and also to undertake formal analysis across disparate texts as a way of assessing quality by recognizing similarities and differences in aesthetics, narratives, cinematography, etcetera. Montage is another important editing technique and it is a kind of editing technique that refers to a series of images and sounds that form a visual pattern. These patterns may may not be very clear, logical or sequential. Now, Soviet montage is one of the earliest and one of the most respected editing techniques. Um, so, this kind of editing technique came out of uh, the Soviet experimental cinema of the 1920s, where uh, someone called Lev Koloshov, we have been uh, referring to him quite often in this course, he first thought, th uh, thought of it, but it is primarily associated with the works of Sergei Eisenstein. Now, Kuleshov, the significant contribution was the idea that each shot is like a building block and it uh, derives its meaning from its context that is the shots placed around it. Uh, Kuleshov felt that juxtaposition of shots must be inherent in all film signs. Shots therefore, acquire meaning when juxtaposed with what comes before and after. So, to put this principle into practice, Koloshov juxtaposed several shots from different pieces of films, which he then turned into a sequence. Okay. So, experimenting with the Koloshov effect, he took the footage of the face of an actor um, and spliced the shots of a woman lying in a coffin, a little girl with a teddy bear and a bowl of soup. The audience uh, reacted positively, believing that the actor had uh, 
acted or performed very well. However, it in reality the actor's face never changed expression, only he still uh, his, his still shot was used. Okay. So, same face, but giving, uh, but juxtaposed with different situations. So, this is called the Kulashev effect. So, Kulashev, in other words, pioneered what is known as creative geography by splicing together bits of action from various sources, various films taken from different spaces, countries, and regions. Um, Along the same time, you also had a great called Jiga Vertov, uh, Vert who made his film Man with the uh, Movie Camera in 1929. And Jiga Vertov combined radical politics with innovative aesthetics. He is credited with what is today known as the city cinema, and uh, the Man with the M Movie Camera is all about a Moscow film and what happens, you know at a certain period in Moscow. And the camera just rolls on as he captures the city, mostly Moscow, but maybe St. Petersburg also uh, occasionally. And uh, its buses and trams and its sports and leisure facilities, its working conditions, citizens, law, order, industries, everything is captured. So, in other words, Zhigavatos, man with a, with a movie camera is a celebration of modern city, filmy aesthetics and political ideals. Okay, so, this is something that you should be attentive to and then we also said another great Russian formalist was Sergei Einstein, who directed films such as Strike, Battleship, Potemkin and October. He too artic articulated the theories of montage and typage, use which means using non-professionals with clear physical traits in representative roles. You should remember that uh, we have been talking about uh, Italian neorealism cinema also, neo Italian neorealist cinema also, where same idea was used that uh, of typage using non-professionals with clear physical traits in order to enact a role. According to Sergi uh, Einstein, Einstein uh, the montage is um, uh, is assembled from separate images that provide a partial representation which are in combination and juxtaposition. Montage at the ideological uh, level suggests conflict and collision. It is particularly used when edit, an, an ed, editor or filmmaker uh, would want to convey a great deal into a brief segment. Eisenstein believed that collision and conflict must be inherent to all visual signs in film, juxtaposition, uh, juxtaposing shots and make them collide or conflict and create meaning and produce meaning through this act. I would like to draw your attention to this particular montage now. It is a scene from Battleship Potemkin and it is famously uh, called Odessa Steps Massacre. So, please watch this sequence in order to uh, understand montage. So, now that you have watched the scene, um, while explaining this famous scene, uh, Einstein postulated that formulation and investigation of the phenomenon of cinema as forms of conflict yield the first possibility of devising a homogeneous system of visual dramaturgy. And this kind of visual sequence um, uh, is uh, capable of uh, uh, you know drawing attention to general and particular cases of a film. Some of the classic montage sequences include, of course, you have seen battle, uh, Battleship Potemkin. <coughs> Citizen Kane, the uh, dining table sequence, the godfather, the baptism massacre sequence, Rocky, the training sequence in uh, Stallone's Rocky and then cinema parody. So, the kissing montage in uh, cinema parody. So, so formalists 
insists on a systematic approach to cinematography. Before the Russian formalists, Hollywood favored continuity editing, which is also preferred by our own filmmakers, Indian filmmakers, because it is not intrusive in nature. And uh, um, generally, we use eye line matching shots and 180 degree shots, establishing and re establishing shots. But formalism and uh, uh, discontinuity editing, they uh, encouraged viewers to uh, think along the lines of close analysis of films, think about the form, organization and the structure of films, they, uh, and they also most importantly encouraged us to read multiple meanings in a movie, thereby leading to the postulation that uh, the work in uh, the work has to be understood in its isolation and not on the basis of the writers or the filmmakers intention. So, more importantly how the work is done ok that is important and uh, we will talk about uh, other theories in detail later in our next classes. Thank you very much.